But I think I told you guys before that I'm a, I'm a big fan of history. Um, I'm, a, I'm a history buff, and so I read a lot about history, and I'm reading the second volume of um, the biography of Winston Churchill. It's called The, the Last Lion. And it's, it takes place, it's really his whole life, it starts with his childhood, but this, this section is talking about um, the early years prior to the war just starting. And I ran across an interesting uh, quote from him that fits in with what we're studying tonight. Uh, you know, we, we've been talking a whole lot about vanity. And I ran across this quote in the preface to this second volume, I don't know what this thing's doing here. I know I have no internet connection. I don't want one. He says, projects undreamed of by past generations will absorb our immediate descendants. Comforts, activities, amenities, pleasures will crowd upon them, but their hearts will ache and their lives will be barren if they have not a vision above material things. I mean, that could have been written by Solomon. And one of the interesting things about Churchill, and I'm a big fan of Churchill, uh, Churchill was not, I don't think he was a Christian. Um, he was not, um, he may have been a deist, but he wasn't a big fan of organized religion. He rarely went to church. Uh, he put most of his stock in humanity and humanity's ability to solve all of life's problems. That's one of the reasons he was such a great leader is he truly believed that the people of England could survive Hitler and the Nazis. But I, I ran across this and it just reminded me of Solomon and everything we've been studying. This idea that you and I, this is really a premonition on his part, that there's a day coming when we're going to have all this stuff and ease and comfort and be surrounded with all the accumulated things of life, but he says, your hearts are going to ache. And I think that's an apt description of our society today. I think that we have so much, especially America, we're blessed, we're, we got more than we can say grace over. It's kind of interesting, my, my wife does work in uh, Africa, and she goes to Ethiopia, and she goes to a specific place in the capital of Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, and she works with people who live literally on a dump. These people scavenge the dump for food. They scavenge it for clothes. And it's, it's a really, really tough uh, environment. And every time she goes over there, she's blown away by the poverty and the need. And then she comes back, and she's blown away by the affluence. And uh, the other day, she, she was kind of put out because a, a friend of hers had written her and asked her to be praying. Would you put this on your prayer list? My mother's cat has to have surgery. And, and my wife likes animals, but that just about did her in. I mean, she had literally just gotten back from Africa, 24-hour flight, tired, exhausted, all the emotions of being with people who have AIDS and people who have no food and people don't know how they're going to survive. And then this woman wants her to pray for her mother's cat. And again, nothing wrong with necessarily praying for your cat, but there are greater things in life than sometimes what we think about and what we get obsessed about. And so I just wanted to share that with you, that the, here's Winston Churchill, former great leader who a lot of people look up to, and yet he saw it coming, that the day is coming when we will become so obsessed with comfort and ease that we lose sight of what's really important. Well, chapter 7 and 8 are kind of interesting because they're going to... Um, give us another glimpse. Last week we looked at how he, Solomon, had a view of life, and his view of life came from his background, his fact that he was the son of David, he was the son of a former king, now he's a king, he's wealthy, he's got wives, he's got concubines, he's got uh, everything he could want, he's the wisest man that's ever lived, and yet he, and so he brings all of that to his view of life. Sometimes it's skewed, sometimes it's accurate. We have to be really careful how we uh, unpack and how we apply what Solomon says because not everything he says is gospel. Not everything is something you need to listen to and go, oh, okay, that's what I'll do. You have to listen to it with kind of a gospel lens. And tonight he's going to give us uh, some further views on life. And chapter 7 is, is interesting because he's going to use the word better over and over again. 
At least seven different times he's going to compare one thing to another. And as I read this, I want to read these verses. It's verses 1 through 13. Listen to what he says, and I want you to think whether you agree with him. Whether you agree with his assessment, because it's kind of odd. He says, a good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death better than the day of birth. It's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. Well, he's already lost me there. I'd much rather go to the house of feasting any day of the week than the house of mourning. And he goes on, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. That's interesting. For by sadness of face, the heart is made glad. He goes on, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It's better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. And then he speaks like Yoda. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools. This is also vanity. Surely oppression drives the wise into madness, and the, a bribe corrupts the heart. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Wisdom is good with an inheritance and advantage to those who see the sun, for the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money, and the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. And then he ends this section with this verse. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? Now there's a lot in these verses. And, and the way I want us to unpack them is the way I, I think he intended them. And we're going to start with the first comparison and we're going to move forward. Because he gives us seven comparative statements in these 13 verses. First he says, a good name is better than ointment. What in the heck does that mean? A, 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 I'm not even sure what ointment is. You know, what does he mean by that? How is a good name better than ointment? Well, you... You've got to dig into this a little bit to find out what he's talking about. And that's what we're going to do. Then he goes on and says, the day of death is better than the day of birth. The house of mourning is better than the house of feasting. Sorrow better than laughter. The rebuke of the wise is better than the song of fools. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. And then finally, the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. So seven comparative statements. All of them, I think, build on one another. And they leave you looking like this. <laughs> Even Spock doesn't understand what he's, thinking, he's saying. It makes no sense. What you, Solomon, what are, you, what are you trying to tell me here? What's your point? Are these things really better than the other? Most of them I, I, I wouldn't bank on because they don't make sense to me. They don't make sense to you unless you look at them through a certain lens. If you look at them through a human lens, a human viewpoint, they make no sense at all. If you look at them through a godly viewpoint, they begin to start, make sense, at least a little bit of sense. None of them are ones that I would normally choose. Um, I would not choose, as I said, the house of mourning over the house of death, or house of mirth, or laughter, or pleasure, or joy. That's just not something I'm going to do. But why does he start with this one? Why does he say a good name is better than ointment? Now, I think when he wrote this, the people he wrote this to got it, understood it. When they read it, it made sense to them because they understood the connection between a good name and ointment because of the Hebrew words involved. The word for a good name or a name is Shem, okay? And it literally means your reputation, your glory, your fame. Every Hebrew wanted a good name. God wants a good name. What's the only way for God's name to be marred? What's the only way? You. Me. God can't harm his name, but you can and one of the reasons he got so hacked with Israel all the time is because they were constantly defaming his name. And so he would have to protect his name. 
Every time something happened with Israel and he would say, okay, I'm done with you, and Moses or someone else would step in and go, oh, wait a minute, you don't want to do that because that will harm your name. See, God protects his name. The Hebrews wanted a good name. And so he uses this, and he's going to do a word play because the word ointment in Hebrew is shemen. So shem, shemen. So he says, a good name is better than ointment. Well, What's ointment? In their day and age, it was, it was an oil they used to anoint. It, it could have been something like myrrh. It could have been something like olive oil. It was any kind of an oil that, that had an, uh, an aroma to it. It typically was used in burial. Why would you anoint a dead body with something that smelled good? Because it's a dead body. And they didn't have refrigeration. And so when they had a funeral for somebody and they lasted for days, guess what? The body would stink. And they would anoint it with oil to keep the odor down. Now you should start seeing what's he talking about. Because ointment in this context is a cover-up. And this is my paraphrase. It's the Ken Miller translation. I'm working on it. should be out next year. <laughs> Being good is better than smelling good. I, I have a son who's now a sergeant in the Marines, and, uh, but when he was a kid, 13, 14 years old, um, he had, um, let's just put it this way, he stunk. He was a typical kid, a typical young man who didn't necessarily like to bathe, and so what he would do is he would cover it up with Axe body spray. <laughs> And I remember picking him up from uh, select soccer, and he'd, he'd be just pouring sweat, and he would get out of his bag, and he'd spray that stuff on there. There is no odor worse on earth than the smell of a 13-year-old sweaty boy and Axe body spray. Axe body spray by itself is bad, but you put it together with that, and it's, it's bad. And I would tell him, it's not working. <laughs> Whatever you think you're doing, it's not working. And I'd roll down the windows and, you know, just, if you think you're attracting girls, those commercials are a lie. Um, but I think this is his point. And as I said, every one of these is going to build on this one. So all the ones he's talking about, from this point forward, hinge on you understanding this. A good name is better than ointment. So as we live under the sun, and this is what he's talking about, it's what the whole book's about, your life under the sun, he's, he's going to compare these seven things, really 14 things, one against the other. And I think this chapter, at least from the first 14 verses, are all about perspective. What's your perspective on life? Last week, it was how he perceived things as a judge, how he perceived things as a businessman. This week, it's more the global perspective. How do we view life? How do we see the things of life? How do we come at these things? So perfume, ointment, oil, cologne can be used to cover up something that stinks. And I think that's his point. But it will not get rid of the stink. It just won't. You may have something in your house that goes bad in your refrigerator, or maybe you've got a dog that can't control itself and goes on the carpet, and you spray stuff on it and try to cover up the smell, and it never goes away. That's really his point. How we try to cover up the truth with a lie, the ointment. A dead body is a dead body, no matter how much perfume you put on it, and it's going to stink. Why? Because it's dead. Perfume doesn't give it life. But a good reputation is important. It's critical. And really what he's describing is hypocrisy. What's hypocrisy? It's living a lie. It's trying to appear as something you're not. And, and you, can, you can live your life a certain way, and you can do certain things with your day, with your life, with your career that are immoral, illegal, unethical, ungodly, and then go over here and try to act like you are godly and moral and ethical, and you try to cover up reality. But guess what? You can't cover it up for long. 
The truth will be found out. You will get exposed. But a good reputation, a good name, is something that lasts forever, as he'll unpack in just a few minutes. So he says, the day of death is better than what? The day of birth. What has that got to do with a good reputation? Here's why I think these things build on one another. When a baby is born, we all celebrate, right? Uh, we just had um, a new grandbaby, a little baby boy born, I guess he's about a month now. And when he was born, we all celebrated. He came out healthy. He came out whole. It was a perfect birth. Nothing went wrong. There were no problems. We were excited. We celebrated. What were we celebrating? New life. Were we, were we celebrating his accomplishments? No. He just came out. And he really had no choice in that process. He got pushed out. He just popped out. He probably would have preferred to stay. But he couldn't. His mom didn't want him in there anymore. So what do we celebrate? We're ce celebrating the potential, but not what's been accomplished. And that's how this ties into a reputation. But here's what's interesting. At a birth, I, I know of nobody that when the baby comes out and you look at that precious baby and you go, man, it's going to be a tough life. You, gosh, you may not make it into college. You're going to probably have a lousy job. You're going to probably marry the wrong person. I'm going to support you till you're probably in your 50s. I mean, I don't know if anybody that's done that, but that's normally not what we do at a birth, right? We celebrate. We speculate. We hope. We dream. But it's all a dream because we don't know what the future holds. And that baby has no reputation. It's accomplished nothing. And the truth is, it can't accomplish anything. So, how does that fit into reputation, fame, birth, death? Why is the day of death better than the day of birth? Well, the day of death hopefully comes after a long life where you've accomplished something, where people can look back. But birth is the beginning, and nobody knows what the future holds. I don't know how my grandson's going to turn out. I'm going to pray really hard that he turns out really well and that he accepts Christ at an early age and that he, he grows up to be a godly young man and marries a godly young woman and they have godly kids and, and I'm still around to enjoy those godly great-grandkids. But I don't know how it's going to turn out. So I can't celebrate what hasn't happened. And that's what makes this really interesting. He says the house of mourning is better. Why? Why would the house of mourning at death, someone's death, be better than the house of mirth and joy surrounded by birth, new life? If you've ever been to a funeral, a memorial service, of somebody who's lived a really good life, it truly is a celebration. My dad died at 93 five years ago, and um, it was a celebration. I miss my dad greatly. He was a godly man. He's my hero. Uh, but my three siblings and I were able to stand up and eulogize my dad because of the life that he lived. It was a celebration of life. But I've done funerals where that's not the case. Matter of fact, I did a, a, a funeral a year or two ago for a couple in the church that I knew really well, and it was for the matriarch of their family. She was in her 80s. She died, and they asked me to do her, her uh, funeral. Well, I didn't know this woman, so I said, well, one of the things I, I like to do if I, I do a funeral for, funeral for somebody I don't know is I want to meet with a family, and one of the things I try to do is get them to tell me about your loved one. Bring me up to speed, because I'm, I'm about to do the funeral for somebody I don't know. And so they gathered all the family. It's a huge family. And they bring all the grandkids, and they bring the cousins, and they bring the siblings, and they bring, all, they all come to this big living room. And I show up, and we're all sitting around on couches and chairs. And I said, well, here's what I want to know. Tell me about your, your grandmother, your mother, your aunt. 
Tell, tell me something about her. And the easiest way I know to do that is just one adjective. Just give me one word that would describe this woman to you. This, this is what it sounded like. And I waited, and I waited, and it got awkward. And I would look around the room, and people are going... I said, you know, hey, it could be funny, it could be sad, it could be two words, it could be three words, it could be a story, it could be just, you know, hey, tell me about, tell me about. <laughs> Nothing. It was crickets. And I'm starting to pour sweat. I'm like, what have I gotten involved in? And I'm staring at the couple who invited me to do this funeral. I'm like, <laughs> you better say something. And finally, this one woman broke the silence, and here's exactly what she said. She was a bitch. <laughs> Man, we're on a roll now. This is going to be good. And then it was just like gang up on grandma. Nobody liked her. She was evil. She was mean. She was abusive, controlling. And her husband had died years ago, and I know why. Um, that was a hard funeral to do. I was just glad to get out of that living room. But I've been at funerals where, where kids have gotten up to eulogize their dad, and they've had nothing good to say. Now, they, they said, you know, he, he was a great businessman. He worked really hard. He took us on some great vacations. But they didn't say anything of spiritual value. And, and that's what I think needs to come out of this for us tonight as you think about what he's telling you. He is an old man at the end of life thinking about what? Death. And he's obsessed with, I haven't ended well. See, I want you to end well. I want me to end well. Some of us are closer to the end than we are to the beginning. But here's truth. Here's reality. You may be 25, and you might be closer to the end than I am. You don't know. I don't know. I could croak on this platform tonight, and you would probably applaud, but I don't know when God's going to take me home. You don't know when God's going to take you home, but you want to end well. See, when you, when you live your life well, People celebrate the life you've lived well. And I think that's his point. Everybody's going to die. He's already talked about that. The book's full of that. It's the nature of the beast. We're all going to die someday. Well, are you getting ready for that? And I don't mean buy your casket and pick out the suit you're going to wear. And I, no, are you ready to end well? How do you end well? You start well. You, you begin now. If you want to have a good reputation when you die, if you want people to eulogize you and say wonderful things about you, it starts now. Don't wait till you're 70. Don't go, well, I'm 55 now. I got, I got plenty of time. I'll worry about my reputation later. No, it'll never come. Begin now because death is going to come to all of us. It's the end of your life that truly matters, not the beginning. I'm glad you were born. I really am. I'm glad you're here. But I'm a whole lot more concerned about how you're going to end. And I think Solomon, as I said last week, if you could sit across the table in Starbucks and talk to Solomon, this is what he's trying to tell you. End well. I didn't. I screwed up. My reputation is shot. Think about this. His reputation is forever in this book. And all you got to do is read about how his life ends. He walked away from God, and God split the kingdom because of him. So he didn't end well. I want to end well. I want you to end well. And I want to end with a good name. See, a good name is better than ointment. Don't try to replicate a good name by perfume, covering up. Don't celebrate birth and not think about death because death is really the key to a good reputation. 
It's how you end, not how you begin. So he says, the house of feasting. The house of mourning is better than the house of feasting. Why? You celebrate and you feast at births. That's what we typically do. But we're celebrating what we don't know. We're celebrating the hope, the future. But when you celebrate the death of a friend who lived a life well, you're celebrating what you do know. He was a good man. He was a godly man. He led his children well. He was a loving husband. He was a loving grandfather. He was an honest businessman. He studied the word. He, he, see, when people stand up and say those things about you, I want my kids, all six of my kids, I want my grandkids, if they're old enough, to stand up at my memorial service and say he was a godly man. Not because I paid them to, but because they looked at my life and they said, he believed in God, he lived for God, he wasn't a hypocrite, he didn't say one thing and do another, he didn't cover himself and douse himself with Axe body spray to cover up the stench of his life. He was real. He was genuine. See, we celebrate at death because a life lived well brings tears to the eyes but joy to the heart. When my dad died, I cried and I smiled. My mom's 97. I don't know how many days she's got left in this planet, but it's going to be the same thing with her. She's a godly woman who's lived a godly life, and she's been a precious example to many, many men and women and, and was faithful to my father for 70 years of marriage. See, I want that to be said about me. I want that to be said about you. Birth looks forward, but it's just hopeful. That's all it can do is hope because we don't know what the future holds. Death, we look back in grateful recognition. Here's what I know, guys. You don't want to be at your deathbed looking back in regret. You really don't. How do you keep that from happening? It begins now. See, Solomon couldn't change a lot of things. Solomon couldn't go back and fix a lot of things that he had done, but he could share what he learned, and that's what he's doing. He's sharing it with you and me. This, this visual kind of grabs me, but basically what gets said at our funeral has far more influence than what gets said at our birth. What do people say at birth? Isn't he cute? Man, he's got his mother's eyes. He's got his dad's big mouth. He's got, he's got more hair than his dad has. He's, you know, he's, man, look at the arms on that kid. He's going to be huge. Look at the feet. Isn't she beautiful? Look at her eyes. Look at, we, we, we look at that and we praise it and we rejoice in it. But what, are the, what do we say at death? She was a bitch? Hope not. She was sweet. She was kind. She was gentle. She was loving. She was merciful. She was gracious. She was godly. See, it's the end that really matters. So look at this. Seven different comparisons. Good name over ointment. Day of death better than day of birth. House of mourning is better than house of feasting. Sorrow is better than laughter. Do you see how they're building on that good reputation? It starts there. And it moves all throughout your life. And then he says, the rebuke of the wise is better than the song of fools. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning. See, this is a guy that's at the end, right? And he's saying, I'm not ending well. This ought to be my swan song. This ought to be my grand exit of life. And I leave a legacy behind me. Well, he left a legacy. Just wasn't a very good one. And then he says, the patient in spirit are better than the proud in spirit. One of his biggest issues was pride. He was smart and he knew it. He was wise and, and he knew it. He was wealthy and he knew it. He had everything he could want and he knew it. And pride got the best of him and it caused him to fail and walk away from God. But he would tell you that God is the one who gives you the ability to see life differently, to see life this way. This is better than this. This is better than this. But see, it's a different perspective than you and I are used to. Because I look at life and you look at life from your perspective. And your perspective, like his, is influenced by what? The world around you. What does the world say? Have fun. Grab all the gusto you can. Get it all now. Live life to the full. But he would say, you know what I've learned after 70 years of life and a lot of mistakes? 
A good name is better than ointment. Day of death is better than the day of birth. House of mourning is better than the house of feasting. End well. Don't waste your life. And don't view life from your own perspective. Because here's what I know. I prefer birth over death. I would much rather celebrate the birth of a child than the death of someone I love. But what, what Solomon helped me understand is that, you know what? This is the one that really matters. The death. I, I, I want to help you die well. That sounds kind of odd, doesn't it? And I don't mean tonight. I want you to end well. I want you to live a life where you can lay your head on the pillow, however you die, that you can go peacefully knowing that, man, I've, I've done everything God's called me to do. I've been faithful. I ended well. But we would rather have the house of feasting over the house of mourning almost every time. I don't think there's anybody walking around going, anybody, anybody have, know of a funeral coming up? I'm looking for a funeral to go to. No, we don't look for funerals. We look for parties. But, but I, I don't enjoy funerals, but I do love hearing people say things about people who have passed that are encouraging. Because it always reminds me, that's what I want to have said about me. Well, here's one thing I know about funerals, having done more of them than I'd like to think about, is that everybody who goes to a funeral thinks about one thing. What do you think it is? It's not the rangers. It's, it's death. It's God. It's, it's the afterlife. It's what's coming next. They may not be a Christian. They may not believe in God, but they're looking at either a casket with a body in it or a picture, a memorial picture of somebody that's now gone that they used to know. And that's going to happen to me. And that's Solomon's point. It is going to happen to you. But we would rather laugh than cry. We'd rather be praised than be rebuked. We like the beginning of something rather than the end. This is just the way we're wired, and we exhibit more pride than we do patience at times. So all of these build on each other, and it's just how he wants us to understand that if we don't take God's view, what we end up with are the perfumes of life, the cover-ups, the things that make us look like what we think we ought to look like, but we really aren't like. They're, they're fake. They're a facade. They're the perfumes of life. They make us smell good to those around us. But here's the reality. Like my 13-year-old son sitting in the back seat of my car, covered with sweat and Axe body spray, you stink. I know what you smell like because I smell you. And that's the truth about when you try to cover up the reality of your life, everyone around you knows but you. And they go, you, you really stink. You, you act a certain way, you try to cover it up, but you really don't smell like you think you smell. We use things that make us feel good, right? That was week one and week two. What did he do? Concubines, wives, singers, a anything he get his hands on, wine, wealth, just to make me feel good. And they, it almost always represents the things we accumulate. Hey, I, I'll just share a, a, an example of this in my own life um, just to help you guys kind of understand how applicable this can be to just everyday life. Um, back on Memorial Day, my, one of my daughters called and said, hey, can I bring the grandkids over? Can we swim in the pool and cook out? And I'm like, my wife was in Africa, and I'm like, yeah, come on over. And then I realized I got to clean the pool. So I go out. And I start cleaning the pool. Well, the pump goes out. And, and when the pump goes out, it, all I see is dollar signs. You know, that, that's going to be $300, $400. Like, so I call a good friend of mine, Terry, who comes to this Bible study, and he happens to be a pool guy. And I said, I need a pump. Well, he got me a pump. So we replaced the pump. I cleaned the pool. The kids came over. We swam. And then I went out this past week, and um, it was green. And so I threw chemicals in it. I threw chlorine in it. Went back out the next day. It's greener. I'm like, that, that doesn't make any sense. So I added more chlorine. It got greener. So I take 
water to Leslie's pool supply and they measure it and they said, well, you've got acid buildup. I said, well, I'm, I know what I've got. What about the pool? You know, it's just, um, no, your pool's got acid buildup. And I said, well, what do I do? What do I buy? What do I pour in it? What chemical can you sell me for more money than I have? And they said, well, there is none. You've got to drain it. Oh. What? Drain it? Yeah, drain it. So for the last week, I've been draining my pool. I had to drain half the water out. Why, why am I telling you that? Why did I put that pool in? To enjoy. To, to swim in. My kids could swim in and, and impress my neighbors and whatever. You know, what, I, I didn't build it to throw money into, but that's what it's become. I've accumulated it, and now it owns me. And every time I walk out, it laughs at me. It, just, it scoffs at me. Look, I'm green. Pour some more chemicals in. See, this stuff is real. It's, it's normal, everyday stuff. It's not that the pool's wrong. It wasn't a sin that I put in the pool. My kids have enjoyed it. My grandkids love it. I hate it. It's just part of life, and I can't let it control me. I can't buy things in hopes that they will cover up the reality of my life. Because here's what that pool really does. It exposes who I really am. Because I walk out and see it green, and I get angry. And, and spending three days draining the pool and watching all that water go out, knowing I'm going to have to replace it with fresh water that comes out of my tap that I'm going to pay for, made me angry. And it reveals my heart. It reveals, you really got a problem with money. You got a real problem with letting go. And, and God uses the pool to what? Train me, expose me, teach me. See, it's the ointment of achievement and visible success that we are addicted to as guys sometimes. Homes, cars, clothes, pools, portfolios, resumes, 401ks, you name it. We gravitate towards it because we think it will cover up it, what is missing in our lives. It's exactly what Winston Churchill said. All this stuff, but it won't cover up the ache inside. We prefer the sweet-smelling, short-lived perfume of a self-indulgent lifestyle. If that offends you, I am sorry, but it's true. And I'm not saying you do all the time. I'm not saying you're, you're just this self-indulgent slug who just is consumed with consuming. No, but it's an addiction that's always there because of the sin nature that dwells within us. And we have to fight it. We have to fight it and not cover up our lives with perfume. Well, he's going to go on the rest of this chapter. He's going to talk about the day of prosperity, be joyful, and the day of adversity. Consider God has made the one as well as the other. See, what he would have you know is that I love the day of prosperity. And I'm not even a prosperity preacher. I love it when things go well. I love it when I go out and the pool's clean and I can swim in it and I don't have to worry about it. I love it when everything in life goes well, but that is not normal. And so he tells me, God has made the day of adversity as much as the day of prosperity. See, that's a different kind of perspective. But here's what I know about you, because it's true of me. When something goes haywire in my life, what do I do? God, why, what, what, what are you doing? Why, what did I do to deserve this? Why do I have to drain half my pool? Why does the pool yellow? Why, what, are you, what are you doing? What have I done wrong? Why are you punishing me? How have I disappointed you? See, when I say those things, either verbally or in my head, I'm saying God didn't make the day of adversity. That can't be of God, because I don't like it. But Solomon would say, you know what I've learned over 70 years of life? He made them both. He made the good, the bad, and the ugly. And he says, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. He's basically saying, guys, I've given you two options in life that you're going to experience the good and the bad. Prosperity, adversity, and it's going to take your mind off of what? All the stuff that comes later. He's just going to keep us busy. Now, this is something that I don't think is necessarily one I want to take to the bank. This is his perspective. I think it's a little bit warped. I think it's a little bit short-sighted. Because one of the things that keeps me going is the fact that I know what the future holds. I don't think there's pool, pools in heaven. And if there are, they don't require chlorine. And they never have to be cleaned. 
See, it's going to get better, and that's what keeps me going. But God has made them both. He says, in my vain life, I've seen everything. I've seen the good. I've seen the bad. They both come from God. We just, just got to endure it. No, you don't have to endure it. You just have to realize that this is part of living life in this planet. And when the bad comes, understand that God's with you. He's not punishing you. He's not angry with you. He's teaching you. He may be disciplining you because you did something you shouldn't have done. But the day of adversity is not necessarily something we run from or need to avoid. See, we prefer sorrow to pain, joy to sorrow, pleasure to pain, happiness to heartache, a good time to a good name. And he would say, don't, don't. That's the wrong perspective. That's not what you should do. I love this from James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. You're very familiar with this, but listen to how it fits in with what he's telling us, Solomon's telling us. When troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Are you nuts? What have you been reading, Solomon? What's wrong with you? For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Embrace the adversity. Don't seek it. Don't wake up in the morning and go, what can I screw up today? <laughs> God will take care of that. But just embrace it when it comes and realize that, you know what? He's going to test my faith. I'm going to endure. I'm going to grow. I'm going to get developed by God. And he's going to use the good, the bad, and the ugly to accomplish it. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you. Reputation. And say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. <sighs> Come on, Lord. Really? Be very glad. I don't know about that one. For a great reward awaits you where? In heaven. See, Jesus had an eternal perspective. Solomon struggled with having an eternal perspective because everything for him was in this life because he didn't understand the afterlife. So we just have to come with a different perspective on life. And he says, who can make straight what the Lord has made crooked? You can't change what God has ordained. You can't stop what God has predetermined to happen. That's why we need to embrace it. Why do things happen in our lives? I don't know. Why does God allow things to take place? I don't know. Why did my pool go yellow? A lot of reasons. But it wasn't to punish me. It was to teach me. It was to re reveal to me that I got an anger problem sometimes and I, I'm impatient and I love money and I hate to spend it and I hate to let go of it. And, but there's a lot of things, but it's not because he's trying to punish me. I love the New Living Translation. Accept the way God does things for who can straighten what he's made crooked. You can't. You can't change it. You can't fix it. You can't alter it. God, he says, is in the extremes, the good and the bad, adversity, prosperity, the pleasant, the painful, death and life, poverty and wealth, joy and sorrow. So here's what he would tell you sitting across the coffee table. Look for God in everything and guess what? You will find him. Look for him. I've had some of you guys come up in, to me and testify about how God took you through darkness. I had a gentleman who, who uh, normally comes on Thursday morning, came up to me a couple of weeks ago after one of these studies, and he's a he's, uh, dear friend of my uh, deceased father-in-law, and he said, when I tell people that my wife and I rejoice in the death of our daughter when she was just a teenager, they don't understand what I'm talking about. And he says, I miss her. I love her. It was tragic. We cried. But I wouldn't be the man I am had that not happened. So that's a different perspective, right? He's at a point in his life where he can look back and he sees God in everything. And sometimes it takes time. So we're to look for God. Well, what do we do? We set our sights on finding joy, pleasure, satisfaction, and significance. And we miss God. What did Solomon do? That. That's what he did. And he walked away from God. His wives, his concubines, and all their false gods led him away from the one true God. Pleasure, significance. And so he says... In my vain life, I've seen everything. There's a, there's a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness. There's a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. So he says, don't be overly righteous and don't make yourself too wise. That's really weird advice, right? Don't be too righteous. Don't be too wise. 
He says, it's going to destroy you. This is another one you got to be really careful. Just because Solomon says it and it's in the Bible doesn't mean it's right. This is his perspective. And I think he's wrong. Because here's what he's saying. It's weird. It's bizarre. It's strange. It's not godly advice. But he's basically saying God gives to those who desire him more than the things that they can get from him. See, he was obsessed with wisdom. He was obsessed with wealth. He was obsessed with gifts from God, but he missed God. God wants to give you far more than a new house, a new car, a new boat, new golf clubs. He wants to give you him. He wants to give you joy. He wants to give you contentment. And so all throughout this chapter and even into the next chapter, he's going to talk about these incongruities, inconsistencies of life. The righteous man dies unexpectedly. The wicked man lives a long life. So he says, don't make righteousness your goal. Why? Because if that's your goal, because you think that's going to be somehow a blessing and you're going to get more stuff, you missed the point. In other words, if your goal to have a quiet time is because you think God will bless you for having a quiet time and give you affluence, you've missed the point of having a quiet time. If you don't have a quiet time because you just don't want to and you don't think it really matters and I'm better off going to work, you've missed the point of having a quiet time. He says, don't waste your time pursuing wisdom, hoping God will reward you with a long life. And don't pursue a life of wickedness, thinking it's the key to get what you want. See, Solomon struggled with, well, maybe I just need to be wicked because they seem to get everything. Maybe I just need to be a fool because fools seem to get away with everything. No. You need to understand that God's involved in all of this. Desire him more than anything else. So here's the summary. What Solomon seems to be saying is that if we pursue righteousness and wisdom, thinking these things will provide us with a long and prosperous free life, free from trouble and trials, we're going to be disappointed. Don't make that your goal. A life of righteousness marked by wisdom is no guarantee of immunity from difficulty. So as, as we wrap this up tonight... Chapter 8 is really going to be just a summary of him talking about the folly of wisdom. Is wisdom good? Yes. But wisdom by itself without God is hopeless and helpless. Don't make wisdom your goal. Don't read the Bible to get smart. Don't read the Bible to impress your friends. Don't read the Bible to cover yourself with the perfume of self-righteousness. Let it change you. Let it convict you. Let it change you into the man that God would have you to be. So I'm going to fast forward because I want to get to the questions. You've got the notes for chapter 8. And really all he's going to say in chapter 8, guys, is wisdom is limited. You don't know what comes next. God hasn't shared everything with us. When we do the book of Revelation, you're going to probably be highly disappointed that I'm not going to tell you everything because I don't know everything. See, there's some things God remain, allows to remain hidden. Wisdom's not the answer. God's the answer. Wealth isn't the answer. God's the answer. Keep your focus on God. So here's what I want you to talk about around your tables. Three basic questions, but not necessarily easy questions. In what ways have you spent your life seeking the gifts instead of the giver? What does this look like in daily life? What are you seeking? What do you turn to that's a good gift from God, but that becomes more important than the one who gave it? Secondly, according to Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you agree with this, this statement, which I think you probably do, why is that true? And if it's true, why don't we do it? What keeps us from doing it? And finally, a good name is developed over time, and it shows up at death. How do we end up masking the true nature of our character with the perfumes of life? What does that look like? And again, if you struggle being open, if you struggle being honest about it, just point to somebody at the table and share for them. Um, <laughs> it always works. It always works. He'll never come back, but that's okay. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for these guys. I, I thank you, Father, for their attentiveness, their willingness to listen. And Lord, I know this is a lot. It's a lot for me. It's a lot of information, but it's, it's so vital for us to hear what Solomon's trying to tell us, what you're trying to tell us through the life of Solomon. 
Lord, he's not God. He's not a guru. He's not a wizard. He's just a man who lived a life, made a lot of mistakes, learned a lot of lessons, has a lot of regrets, and is just trying to share with us. Help us to listen. Help us to learn from his mistakes. Help us learn from our mistakes. Open our eyes. Open our hearts. Open our mouths. Help us to share and continue your work of transforming us into the likeness of your Son, that, Father, every man in this room may end his life well. And I pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.